It's September the 8th, 2016, and tonight's RNN featured show is Connecting the Dots with Mr. Dan Happel. Welcome to the Republic News Network for our live national broadcast. You may call me Kelby, and I'm going to be acting as your moderator. The RNN, which stands for the Republic News Network, has been doing this radio show for about six years, and it's always been a friendly introduction for the people of the United States Corporation. It's true. The United States is a federal corporation, and their exclusive jurisdiction lies within the District of Columbia. See, the Republic government was just a bunch of U.S. citizens that realized they wanted to be Americans as our founders intended. We've been hard at work now for eight years and have successfully re-inhabited and ceded the original government vacated under Lincoln in 1861. I know it's hard to understand. Don't worry. We are law-abiding, peaceful Americans and very pro-government. You can consider the Republic members are tired of all the corruption that we see every day. See, we found in the law that there is, in fact, two forms of government here in our land, and we did something about it. We're just people. We have mothers, fathers, sons, and daughters. We have families just like you, and we simply found some truths. We're now sharing these important truths with the rest of the world, so get ready to hear things that sound amazing and get ready to understand that you, too, are about to be a part of history. We welcome each one of you to connect into dots with Dan Happel and the Republic for the United States of America. Before we go into our broadcast, please bow your head in prayer. Father, we want to thank you for this opportunity to pray nationally, pray publicly, and we do so and, act, and ask, Lord, that you protect the people that are on this call speaking the truth. We ask, Lord, that you cover them. You cover the uh, Americans that are listening. And, Lord, we ask that you intervene for this country that is in such bad need of your help. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Mr. Happel, I yield the floor to you. Thank you, Kelby. Uh, tonight's show uh, proves to be a very interesting show. Uh, the Connecting the Dots program for tonight is uh, titled... Using Indigenous People to Destroy Private Property. Uh, subheading of that is Tribalism and Racism, Useful Tools for Global Plans. Now, <clears throat> with that said, we have uh, a very interesting uh, program tonight because we are dealing with a subject that is really a subject that very few people have any understanding whatsoever about. Uh, in... Um, uh, 2006, uh, a, a UN uh, treaty on on uh, indigenous peoples was proposed and uh, to the Security Council, and it was passed along. And uh, in 2007, uh, President uh, George W. Bush uh, refused to sign that, along with uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada and the United States, but uh, most other countries of the world signed on to that agreement. We were the four holdouts. Uh, since then, all four of those countries have signed on to this Indigenous Peoples Treaty, and uh, President uh, Obama signed on as uh, President of the United States. However, that treaty has never been ratified by the U.S. Senate, which is required by law under our constitutional system of government. And our guest tonight, Elaine Wellman, who has been on our show before. Uh, Elaine is a uh, Native American tribal member, and she has, uh, she's a, a MPA, a Master of Public Administration. She's uh, studied law. She's been involved in a number of these uh, water and um, Indian reservation issues, and she is a, a very, very knowledgeable person on uh, the whole concept of um, the uh, uh, Indigenous Peoples Treaty. So she's our guest, along with another gentleman who has been our guest several times and uh, who I've uh, become extremely uh, impressed with this young man. He is a, a brilliant writer. And he has written a number of books. He is also international correspondent uh, for the uh, New American Magazine. And he, uh, this gentleman's name is Alex Newman. And Alex has written, I'm thinking, probably around a dozen or close to a dozen articles on uh, the indigenous people's uh, idea and on the treaty and some of the uh, law that went into that. So uh, with that said, uh, tonight's program 
uh, will be a, uh, a program emphasizing that uh, we are really reporting on this rat- unratified treaty because it's harmful to private property and liberty <clears throat> and will be enacted through soft laws and administrative fiat, much as the 1992 uh, Sustainability Treaty under the UN. And that was voted down by the Senate in uh, 1994 on a vote of 98 to 2, and yet it's being implemented through cabinet-level agencies as if it were law. And that's what we see happening with the Indigenous Peoples Treaty. So, Elaine and Alex, uh, first of all, uh, with that introduction, uh, thank you for being on our show. And uh, would you please, uh, you know, I'll leave it to you, whoever wants to speak first, but I would like you folks to give us a detailed overview of what the UN Indigenous Peoples Treaty really is and why it is important to citizens worldwide to understand what this treaty is. Let's start with Alex because he has a much greater expertise on the United Nations Indigenous Peoples Movement than I do. And then I will tie federal Indian policy in with it because it's completely connected. Okay, great. Alex, would you like to Very address good. it? Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me, Dan. I appreciate the opportunity. And uh, I think the, you know, the first thing that people need to understand is that this treaty were to be ratified and implemented, basically every square inch of the United States today, you know, what we call America, would need to be handed over to uh, you know, these Indian tribes. And uh, you know, that's no exaggeration. If you read the language of the treaty, it says uh, you know, all the land that the, Indi- that the Indians have had, uh, you know, any historical uh, use or that they've you know, done anything with it in the past, and, uh, you know, it, it essentially covers every square inch of this country with maybe a handful of exceptions where Indians have, uh, you know, never been for any purpose. Uh, and, you know, when you think of the implications of that, it's huge. That's all of our private property gone. That's everything. I mean, that's our whole country gone, right? So we don't have a right to live in our own country anymore. We need to give it all back to, you know, people who, uh, of course, didn't even exist uh, 250 years ago, you know, people who were born uh, in the last 50, 60, 70, 80 years and, uh, you know, it would essentially abolish the United States if enforced as written. And I, one of the things that struck me the most, one of the things that actually got me interested in and looking at this in the, in the first place was something that was happening in Brazil. Uh, I lived in Brazil for, for about four years, and I've been back many, many times since then. I have a lot of great friends in Brazil, you know, all up and down uh, the social hierarchy from, uh, you know, elite people down to, to poor people. So I get a lot of information from Brazil. And uh, come to find out, there was uh, this huge area in northern Brazil, really isolated, really rural. Uh, you know, these people really have almost no connection to the outside world. And uh, the government, actually uh, federal troops wearing U.N. insignia, running around in uh, tanks with U.N. insignia, were wiping entire villages off the map. And I said, oh, my goodness, we know this can't even be true. What could possibly be going on here? What you know to make a very long story short, and I did uh, several really in-depth investigations into this problem because literally nobody else on the face of the earth was reporting it. There was a, a handful of uh, local media outlets down in Brazil that touched on it, and uh, you know this was a story that I think needed to be told. You had entire towns, thousands of people who had been established there for many generations, being wiped off the face of the earth. You know they, they were just being told to demolish their own houses abandon, you know, the graveyards where their ancestors were buried, demolish their hospitals, demolish their schools, and, uh, you know, go live in slums somewhere or go find, you know, make a shack in the forest somewhere just to be torn down later. So, you know, this was absolutely monstrous. And the fact that it was being done at gunpoint with, uh, you know, federal troops wearing UN insignia, I knew uh, that something was up here. So long story short, I investigated this. I interviewed as many people as I could from the government, from the local people who lived there, from the tribes, from the attorneys involved in all this. And um, this was all taking place under the guise of enforcing this UN Indian Treaty. They were, you know, the, the government said, well, we have to give back all the land that's ever, uh, you know, at any time had an Indian on it. You know, even if they were just passing through, if they used it, if it's, you know, cultural, if they just passed through one time. Um, and you know, that meant that all the people who lived there had to be removed. And 
come to find out, the uh, alleged Indians that allegedly lived on this land, uh, you know, hundreds of years ago, supposedly, never actually even lived there. And the Indian tribe itself was saying this. I talked to some of the tribal members. There's video of them on television talking about this. The government did multiple investigations and said that these Indians never lived here. In fact, these Indians lived in a totally different area. They didn't even live in the same kind of ecosystem. Uh, they have uh, the Cejado and the, the forest, and these Indians that the government said lived there actually lived in the forest, and this was the Cejado area, which is kind of uh, you know plain, savanna-type area. And yet all these towns were being wiped out. So this was a, a massive human tragedy. Thousands of people made homeless, and you know these are such poor people. These are people who you know have a shirt on their back and maybe a little hut made of uh, you know some bricks and a couple of pieces of tin, it, it, and it was. You know, nobody cared. You had you know little kids crying their eyes out, clutching their teddy bears, while uh, troops at gunpoint are ordering their parents to demolish their own houses. And this was all being perpetrated under the guise of enforcing this ridiculous UN treaty. So I think this should give people an idea of the monstrousness of all this, right? And when you realize that the UN and the Brazilian government and the Obama administration don't give a lick about Indians, they don't give a lick about anybody except themselves and their own power, uh, you know, you realize that we're dealing with a very big problem here. And uh, I came into contact with Elaine, who, uh, you know, is, is really the expert of experts on this subject as it relates to the United States. And, um, you know, as you mentioned, this treaty has not been ratified yet, but Obama is acting as if it has been. He's, uh, you know, using executive orders, and uh, he created a White House executive council on uh, Indian tribes that he's been using to implement a lot of this. And we need to stop it, and, and I think Elaine will be able to give a much better uh, picture of what's happening in the United States and what will happen if people don't take action and put a stop to this. Great. Well, thank you, Alex. And uh, Elaine, I, uh, something I know you wanted to mention uh, is the fact that uh, uh, the forces creating much of this law, the regional, national, and international agencies are not tribal governments, and that is really important. So um, would you please uh, talk about your perspective on on the uh, way these uh, treaties are being implemented? It, exactly, Dan. And, and, but first I'd like to start with a little disclaimer. Uh, I am of strong Cherokee ancestry. My mother and grandmother were both enrolled, and I am enrollable, but I'm not an enrolled tribal member and never have been. And my husband is Shoshone and a direct descendant of Sacagawea. And the reason I always mention that is because I have and my husband has a lifetime affection for American Indian culture and our own family histories. Uh, and this is not about the, the, the uh, Native Americans that, that live in our country. This is about government decisions that are destroying the American Indian culture um, with with uh, certain decisions that are made. Tribal governments do not make any of these decisions, but before I go there, I want the listener, because most of the listeners, particularly in the urban areas or if they don't live around an Indian reservation, are, as I was, clueless when I lived down in Southern California, clueless about any of this. So let's start with just asking the listener to visualize the 50 states in Alaska and Hawaii. That map has been the same map of the 50 states forever, for decades, since the last state became a state, Hawaii. Um, and that map has never changed. Every state has a fixed land base. No state has expanded or can grow its land base or its resources. They are fixed. Now, within those 50 states, there are 567 tribal governments. I'll use Washington State as the real poster child. Washington State's boundary is fixed forever. It can't take part of Idaho or Oregon. There are 31 tribal governments, separate little quasi-governments, within the state of Washington. And they all have uh, tax-exempt gaming, in addition to all of their basic needs being federally subsidized by Congress. Um, and so the gaming revenue is free money. Their housing, health, education, language, tribal court, law enforcement, everything is paid for by the American taxpayer through Congress. So that big gaming revenue is used, it's tax exempt, it takes taxes out of the local communities that host these class three casinos, and it buys up adjacent lands, 
takes them off the market, takes them off the tax base. So 31 tribal governments in the state of Washington alone are growing their land base within the state. What does that mean to the folks that live in Seattle and the urban areas? That means that as the state property tax goes away in Washington State in proportion to the escalating tax-exempt land shifting to tribes, the taxpayers pick up the tap. So that's part of the problem. But the real point is that a tribal government is not doing a single thing. Not one of these 567 tribes is doing a single thing because of any laws they enact. These laws, all of federal Indian policy, come directly from the executive branch, Congress, or the court. And so it is those folks that we elect that are doing this to the states they serve. And that is the that is the most harmful thing an elected official serving the state can do to his constituents. As an example, I recently, uh, well, it was New American, uh, published an article I wrote recently focusing on the four northwestern states of um, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, and Montana. Thirteen million people live in those four states. Um, less than 3% of those people are enrolled tribal members within the uh, 53 tribes in those four states. So these decisions, like the Indian Self-Determination Act, the Indian Reorganization Act, um, the Indian Energy Policy Act, that's a new dangerous one that came out in 2010. All of these decisions that our senators and congressmen are making to throw constant benefits and escalation of federal Indian policy is done with a direct consequence to the rest of the people that live in those states. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a really disruptive thing, and we're experiencing it here in Montana severely because in the course of the research I've done on federal Indian policy over the years, I was one of those folks that not too long ago thought folks that mentioned Agenda 21 or United Nations or global, um, uh, the Global Initiative or One World Order. Not too many years ago, I was one of those who thought, oh, that's the Tim Hat people. Uh, I've certainly been educated, but the way I became educated to this is I came in the back door. I, came, I started seeing language in federal Indian policy coming out of the Department of Interior coming out of the Environmental Protection Agency, coming out of the USDA Agriculture, coming out of all these alphabet federal agencies. And the language going into federal Indian policy regulations was exactly consistent with and supportive of the language in Agenda 21 and the One World Order and the United Nations. And so I came into this discovery of the global movement to take down this country through the language within existing federal Indian policy. And then I have to think, well, who creates this policy? It's our senators, our congressmen, or the courts, or the executive branch through proclamation. It's our elected officials doing this to the states and the people they serve. So within the four states of the Northwest, which are at really high risk of being the first ones to fall, Within the four states we serve, 97% of the folks that live in these states are voiceless, have been abandoned by their state representatives, absolutely abandoned. Here on the Flathead Indian Reservation where I currently live and have for over a year, the state of Montana has completely walked away from 35,000 Montana citizens that live here. And I don't mean just signed off and walked away. I mean the state of Montana is now in an adversarial role with their landowners, their farmers, their ranchers, their local businesses, and their towns and communities on this reservation. Um, Governor Bullock, when he signed a, a proposed water settlement compact with the uh, Salish Kootenai tribe here, undid a major landmark ruling that, w that was powerful across the country that the state of Montana brought into play. This is the sad thing. The state of Montana fought for 10 years back in the 70s to appropriately accommodate the seven tribes in the state 
but to be sure that Montana citizens were never governed by a tribal government. So there was a landmark case. took 10 years to get up to the Supreme Court, probably cost the state a good deal of money, but they were vehemently protecting the citizens of Montana in balancing the appropriate authority of tribal governments here. So the, that landmark case, Montana versus U.S., said that a tribal government had zero authority over a, tri- a non-tribal person or property unless that individual consented. So living in Montana, if a tribal government was to send me a letter or knock on my door, unless I consent, they have no authority over me under that landmark case. And that applies across the country. Montana did the whole country a service with that landmark ruling. And then Governor Bullock comes along and signs this consent to transfer all the waters of the state to the tribal government, transfer all the authorities of the state, to a tribal government, and he took away the consent, the consent of 35,000 people that live on the reservation. Right, and and with that, Elaine, um, really what it boils down to uh, are are citizens of of the uh, uh, state who are non-tribal members. Uh, we don't have the right to give away their constitutional rights, and if no. uh, if they're under tribal authority, they no longer have those constitutional rights guaranteed under yeah. our uh, system of government. Is that correct? Yes. That is correct. And one of the things that I have harped on for the last couple of years is the executive branch overreaching. I have been pointing the finger at the Obama administration and actually the Bush administration prior and several others, but it has gone on steroids under the Obama administration. And I've been preaching about executive branch overreaching. And then very recently, I started looking at some of the congressional bills, and I thought, oh, my God, we have congressional federal overreaching right now. There's a cluster. Actually, there's dozens. Today I was looking on the congressional website. There's dozens of forestry bills that that are in the House and the Senate. But there's a few key bills that are moving right now that would transfer the management of our national forests to these tribal governments. Now, the American population is 324 million people, and the transfer of our national parks, the management and authority of our national parks to tribal governments will go to the benefit of a little over a million, just, you know, less than, what, maybe 2% of the top, because not all people that say they're Native American are, are tribal members. So here's the concept about to hand off our national parks management to tribal governments across the country, you know, to the peril of 324 million citizens they serve. And I find that absolutely outrageous, absolutely outrageous, because tribal governments have zero duty to a non-tribal person. They have no duty once they get the management, they can set it up any way they want. Access to the forest, use of the forest, the impact on tourism, recreation, hunting, fishing will all be up to the tribal government, and not a single non-tribal member has a voice with the tribal government. So for this, our senators and congressmen to even think along these lines both completely in to the Agenda 21 process to depopulate the area, to, to take away the state's authorities, to transfer all these, all these major resources, to transfer our forests, our lands, our waters, our energy, to tribal government, is, is, is abominable. So that's what we're fighting as hard as we can, and it's really difficult because this is a subject mainstream media won't touch with a stick. And Congress, by the review of the forestry bills, the dozens of them, I'm afraid they're going to play the shell game where they might pull some language out of one bill, but it'll stay in another, and they'll shift and shuffle these bills around, and the American public won't have a clue until it hits them, and they wake up and find that this Congress has passed a bill that's giving the national parks to tribes, and Obama will be the first. He'll, he won't be able to find it fast enough. I'm concerned that they're trying to get this done in this lame duck session. Very concerned. So a lot of us across the country are raising holy hell. 
Well, Elaine, I, you know, with that comment said, and uh, I'm not sure, but I think you may want to check your phone. I, we're getting a lot of kind of wind noise uh, uh, on on the call, and I, I'm not sure if someone is uh, outside where there's a windy condition. Well, but you know, I had, oh, no, I'm inside, but I had it on speakerphone. Is that better? Yeah, it, it it is. Yes, that okay, is better. Okay, it must. Be, I'm sorry about that. that okay, no been. problem. Um, and uh, uh, one of the things that I wanted to stay uh, state uh, here on the radio show is that today I've been contacted by uh, Senator Steve Dane's office uh, about this program tonight, and uh, Senator Dane's um, is uh, quite concerned that uh, he uh, that his bill really truly reflect uh what what the citizens of montana uh and constitutionally what we should be doing and so uh i suggested that um uh he and his staff possibly listen to tonight's program and give him a really good uh overview on exactly what this indigenous peoples treaty is all about and we can certainly send them uh, a lot of different publications and information on exactly what that uh, treaty was all about. And incidentally, it has not been ratified, uh, again, as we said earlier. So uh, it's strictly being done through the executive branch and through Mm -hmm. um, a few bills here and there. And now we've got a lot of those bills in Congress, Mm -hmm. and we need to be very aware that like the uh, uh, Salish Kootenai Water Compact bill, uh, the biggest thing that I see with that bill is it takes water that is water of the state of Montana and owned by the state and turns the jurisdiction for that water over to the federal government as a trustee uh, yeah. for the tribe. Is that is that correct, Elaine? That's correct, and I had been t- I had been living in uh, Wisconsin on the former Oneida Reservation, um, and ha- had been invited out by Montana folks five different times between September 2014 and April 2015. And on my very first trip out here, when I snapped to the peril that the, the state of Montana was actually considering a transferring its state waters to a tribal government. I immediately thought of a major landmark case that the Supreme Court came down with in 2013. It's called Parent versus Herman, uh, June 13, 2013. Parent versus Herman. And it's a water compact bill that was ratified by Congress uh, among four states, Arkansas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Texas. Those four states agreed to share water with each other as needed and as available. And so because it was an interstate compact, it had to be ratified by compact by Congress and was a federal compact, much like this Salish Kootenai will be. In that case, 9-0 ruling, and the, and the uh, justice that wrote the ruling was the most liberal justice on the bench, Justice Sotomayor, wrote a 9-0 court ruling that says, and I will quote this exactly, states have the absolute right and authority for all navigable waters and the soils beneath them, for all lands ceded to that state upon statehood. 9-0. States have the absolute right and authority, all navigable waters and the soils beneath them, for all lands ceded to the state upon statehood. So when I first came out here and saw what this state was doing, I thought, well, they, they just missed that tariff bill. I'll give it to them. And I, I submitted it to Governor Bullock. I submitted it to Attorney General Fox. I also gave testimony and submitted it to the state legislators' water uh, policy implementation committee. I submitted it everywhere I could. I thought, look, state, don't do this to yourselves. It was entirely ignored, entirely ignored. And then the attorney general put out a white paper to the state legislators saying, oh, all this compact is constitutional. Oh, not to worry, nothing to see here. We're all doing the right thing. It passes mm-hmm. muster with the Montana Constitution and the U.S. Constitution, and not to worry. I, I and, saw that letter, and that was actually what the uh, Farm Bureau hung its hat on when it was uh, yeah. uh, fully supporting that bill. Yeah. Well, it's, it, it strikes me as a little ironic that we now have an attorney general who's been adopted into the Crow tribe, and his Crow name is uh, Chief Spirit Runner, um, 
and uh, he bragged in his first week in office he took 50 of his attorney, attorney general staff down to the headquarters of the Salish Kootenai tribe here in Pablo, Montana. He took 50 AG staff to the tribal headquarters here to be totally educated as to what all this tribe desired, what all this tribe's policies were. And then as recently as May of 2016, our state DNRC took 100 state DNRC employees down for a two-day training workshop on what this tribe expects with its cultural resources and water and such as that. This state has entirely caved to a, a, a concept that tribalism, that tribal sovereignty is superior to state sovereignty. All of our legislators are behaving and, and setting leg, passing bills and doing policy as though tribal sovereignty is somehow superior to state sovereignty. And that's been happening in Washington State and many of the other states, but I've never seen it happen as outrageously as it is here, which is really frightening because Montana is a really big, wonderful state with abundant resources, but a small population. And so the tribal money and the tribal political pressure here uh, is applied fiercely. These state legislators can't, most of them, we have some wonderful rare exceptions, but most of them can't do enough for the tribes. And every time they do something for the tribes, 97% of Montana population suffers. So our well, job is to get these congressmen either educated or out. That's right, where I'm and, coming and from, and that's where many of us are coming from now. Well, and Elaine, I think, you know, the fact that... Um, uh, six percent of Montana, I believe it's around six percent of Montana is Navy, uh, Native American. Yes. But uh, one of the one of the things that uh, comes to the fore on this is that uh, even though all these bills and all this largesse and all these things are supposedly to improve the lot of the tribe, uh, very little has changed on on uh, the reservations for the average. Uh, member of the tribe, uh, if they're not part of the uh, ruling hierarchy or they're not part of the, uh, uh, let's say, the uh, tribal management, uh, there's not a whole lot that's gone uh, to the uh, to the individuals on, on the reservation. Never really has. I, I mean, you can't have, make a cookie cutter. Not all tribal governments are the same, but uh, <clears throat> predominantly the money does not get down to the people. It just does right. not. And that responsibility is based upon two things. The Secretary of Interior and the Bureau of Indian Affairs implement the regulations and policies of the bills that Congress passes and the appropriation monies that Congress sends out. So the, the, the dance they do is they want to honor tribal sovereign, you know, the uh, self-governance so they want they want to honor that, and they say, okay, here's your money for housing, um, and we expect you to do money with housing. But whether or not the houses get built is not something that's audited and controlled. And so the, many of the houses they just don't get built. Right. Same thing for for many of the other tribal programs. Congress passes the money out. They look to the BIA to manage the money. The BIA is, is entirely tribal employees. And the BIA says, here's your money, do the right thing. And then the right thing does not trickle down to the tribal members. Mm -hmm. and, and so for decades, the money has gone missing. There's another thing. No one, uh, I asked, there was a fellow named uh, uh, George Skibine, S-K-I-B-I-N-E. George Skibine was the go-to guy at the Bureau of Indian Affairs for probably 30 years. And we invited him to a national conference once. And what, as a speaker, and one of our guests asked him, Mr. Skabeen, has the federal government ever audited the annual dollars going out to tribal governments every year uh, among all the agencies? Because money's come out from all 29 federal agencies now to all 567 tribes every year. And he was asked, we asked Skabeen, has the federal government ever audited that annual figure? Well, no, was the answer. And so the follow-up question was, don't you think you should? He said, I don't see any reason to. And it's never been audited. 
So if you look at these dollars going out for housing, law enforcement, tribal courts, roads, everything a tribal government needs to function is funded by the American taxpayer. All this money is going out, and nobody's looking over looking over at the records. There's no audits, and nobody's accounting for it. And I would bet money that that figure is equivalent to the defense budget, and it's been going on for decades. I mean wow. decades. Wow. And we're the ones we're the ones that are forced to. I call the taxpayers indentured servants to to this federal Indian policy hoax, and I call it a hoax because there's not a single reference in the U.S. Constitution to tribal governance, to tribal sovereignty. There's nothing. Even even Justice Clarence Thomas, um, as early as 2004, was trying to rein this stuff in in one of his rulings. And as recently as this, this last session, in a case called U.S. v. Bryant, he challenged his peers and he challenged Congress to say, where is your plenary power over Indian tribes? Where in the Constitution is it? And then he said, it isn't there. Congress has plenary power over Indian commerce, but not Indian tribes. And it's Justice Thomas's position that all of this federal Indian policy is completely outside the four corners of the U.S. Constitution, and he calls it a fiction. Well, it's been a very expensive fiction for the American taxpayers, and it's a prison camp for tribal members on most reservations who don't dare disagree with their government. They have no rights. They have no civil rights. I mean, there is a Civil Rights Act, but it has no enforcement authority. And so this is just a travesty that is now being used to take down and diminish in incrementally state authorities and mm-hmm. property rights and constitutional rights and all the rights the American citizens have. Well, um, you know, Elaine, uh, I'm, I'm gonna we're gonna stop uh, here for a short break. Uh, Kelby, uh, give Kelby an opportunity to uh, uh, talk about the uh, Republic News Network, and then when we come back, uh, Alex, I would like to have you uh, kind of address the tearing down of our basic institutions and the ensuing uh, chaos that uh, looks to be part of this uh, overall plan. So, uh, Kelby, with that, we'll give you the the floor, and we'll be back in a few minutes. Thank you, Dan. Ladies and gentlemen, um, please look to RepublicForTheUnitedStates.org. Again, RepublicForTheUnitedStates.org. We've been doing radio shows on the RNN News Network for about six years now. And it's always been, like I said, a friendly introduction to people that are just coming into an understanding of the dual jurisdictions that lie within this land. This show is a very important. This show is a is a very important show, as you're hearing about the indigenous people and and how the uh, uh, true agenda that is coming through legislation to come and take um, uh, really land and private property that doesn't belong to the people. Well, there is options for people to look towards and re-inhabit the de jure form of government on this land that was intended by our fathers in 1776 uh, as under the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution as we have adopted those as our founding law and we are building this nation back from the ground up, de jure, not de facto, not corporation, under God. Um, we would encourage you to come to our calls. You can find all of our calls throughout the week on republicforTheUnitedStates.org and uh, we have a special Wednesday evening call. It's uh, Building the States. It's actually the teaching on how to do it uh, to seat those local state municipalities and uh, uh, de jure counties. Um, once again, we thank you, and I yield the floor to Mr. Happel. Okay. Thank you, Kelby. Um, with that, uh, Alex, uh, would, you, would you like to talk about the uh, uh, tearing down of our basic institutions? Because we've had you on the show before, and we've had – a lot of these discussions and part of, in my mind, part of the Indigenous Peoples Treaty is really based on uh, kind of disassembling a lot of our basic institutions and ways of looking at private property and so forth and turning that system on its head. Would you, um, I'd, I'd love to hear your comments and your feelings on how that's being implemented through this particular treaty and then other treaties and other uh, avenues that uh, are being imposed on us through uh, federal government, but also through uh, the UN. Sure. Well, you know, I I, I think the the issues that we're discussing tonight, having to do with uh, you know these federally funded 
tribal governments that are being used, uh, you know, uh, in, in this kind of war on the American people, I think, is the, and, and on the American people's liberty. Um, this is just one component of a much broader war. And, you know, we've talked about some of the other strands on this program, uh, you know, Agenda 21, the pseudo-environmentalism, the global warming hoax, uh, all of these things, you know, they, they might seem like they're independent, like they might seem unrelated, but when you look at the big picture, you see that these are all part of a very coherent operation. Uh, they only have the appearance of being these independent um, operations. And, you know, your low-level bureaucrat, even your mid-level bureaucrat, really doesn't know the big picture, right? A lot of them probably believe, uh, oh, yeah, global warming is a big crisis. We need to regulate carbon dioxide. We need to get rid of private property rights. But when you put the whole picture together, uh, you know, in the Declaration of Independence, it talks about, uh, you know, all these assaults that evidence, uh, you know, a design to reduce us under absolute tyranny. That is absolutely what we're facing right now. Uh, it's, you know, an orchestrated assault on really everything that this country was founded on, from uh, private property rights to the idea of God-given liberties that should be protected by governments. Um, and with all of this under assault, um, you know, we really have a big risk here of losing it all. And, uh, you know, for our children and for our children's children, we need to make sure that that doesn't happen. Now, back to the, you know, the indigenous people's subject, uh, I think one of the, the most shocking examples for me, uh, and we actually did a cover story about this in the New American Magazine some years ago, uh, is what happened in Wyoming. <laughs> now, uh, I haven't checked back on it um, lately, so I'm not sure if it's, uh, if it's been resolved or what's happening with it. Maybe Elaine knows, but what happened, uh, at the time at least, was the EPA came along and uh, they basically just put three non-Indian towns in Wyoming. Uh, in Fremont County, it's called, within the boundaries of a, of a tribal government. And, you know, they put all the property and all the non-tribal members under the jurisdiction of this tribal government. And, uh, you know, the, the implications of this are huge. You have uh, now people who have no voice in the tribal government, no voting rights, no nothing, supposedly under the jurisdiction of this you know, federally funded tribal government, and, you know, what recourse do they have? So they, they did eventually put a stay on it while it went through, uh, through the courts, but it wasn't the first time something like this had happened. And, uh, you know, it's just one drop in the bucket, but I think it illustrates well the, the battle that we're fighting. You know, if, if we don't pay attention, if we don't connect the dots, we're going to end up losing our liberties, losing our freedom, and uh, really losing our country. So it is, um, you know, a very urgent thing. The Indigenous Peoples Treaty is just one component of it. And, you know, to give people an idea of how extreme they're getting with this now, uh, the UN, um, I think he's a special rapporteur in charge of the uh, Indigenous Peoples issues, he said that the United States should give back, give back uh, Mount Rushmore. So, uh, you know, they're talking about a full-blown assault on the American people's heritage, on our Constitution, on our liberties, and... You know, it's, it's, a, it's a systematic assault, and it, it needs to be viewed in the context of Agenda 21. It needs to be viewed in the context of the U.N.'s population policies. They want to get everybody, you know, stuffed into the cities, and they've been very clear about this. Uh, you know, in some of their official reports, uh, U.N. Habitat 1, Habitat 2, Habitat 3, they've just come out and openly said that, uh, you know, private land ownership contributes to social injustice, and we need to undo it. So, um, you know, I, I think people need to be aware of these things because if we don't educate ourselves and educate others about these issues, we are quite literally facing the end of our liberty. So, I think that's uh, very well stated, Alex, and uh, I know that there is uh, uh, certainly an a attempt to deindustrialize much of the developed world uh, under UN Agenda 21 and under... Uh, the uh, UN Agenda 2030, they've been very, uh, very explicit on those policies, and uh, and they're they're real serious about this. And I don't think our elected officials quite understand how serious this really is. I think they still a lot of them believe that uh, the UN is this toothless agency that has no power over the American people, and meanwhile. We're ceding all of our liberty uh, and all of our, our institutions that were 
part of our constitutional heritage to the UN, and uh, that's a really scary thought. Uh, it is, Elaine, and you know, we. Uh, uh, no, I just ahead. want to add one more thing, if that's okay, Dan. Uh, if you look at what's happening right this instant with the uh, with the UN's global warming regime, um, I think you get a very good picture of um, you know another component of this battle. But it's very relevant to the indigenous issue as well because this is exactly the same thing they're doing with the uh, Indigenous Peoples Treaty. Um, but what they've done with this uh, UN Global Warming Treaty, Obama was just over in uh, Hangzhou, China, just a few days ago. He made this announcement with the mass murdering communist dictator over there that they had uh, ratified the Paris Agreement, which is the global warming agreement that they came up with uh, at the UN summit in Paris. I was actually there for that. It was a, a very bizarre experience. And uh, you know, this is a treaty in every sense of the word. It has more than a hundred. The word "shall" appears more than a hundred times in this document. Governments shall, people shall. Uh, Obama promised to reduce uh, the, the carbon emissions, you know, the emissions of the gas of life of the American people by 30%. Uh, you know, the amount of economic uh, pain associated with that is in, impossible to quantify. I mean, Obama said it pretty well when he said electricity rates are necessarily going to have to skyrocket under his plan. He wasn't lying, you know, for once. He was telling the truth. Mm -hmm. And um, that is the agenda. You know, if the prices of electricity skyrocket, the prices of everything will skyrocket. Our jobs will, you know, the exodus of jobs will accelerate. The deindustrialization of the United States will accelerate. The building up of communist China will continue. And, um, you know, this this indigenous issue, um, it doesn't affect just the United States. It, it's really being used um, against the entire Western world, uh, just, just exactly like this uh, climate hoax. If you look, for example, at Australia, they're facing the same thing. You know, they have uh, the Aboriginal peoples there, and uh, they're using them um, as kind of a, a tool against the Australian people. The same thing in Canada is happening. You have the UN special rapporteurs coming and saying, "Oh, you're, you know, you need to do this and you need to do that and this, that, and the other to comply with this Indian treaty." Same thing with New Zealand. Uh, same thing with you know all of the Latin American countries. Huge issues on this exact thing in Panama. Uh, you know, trying to, to force the government to do different things to comply with this treaty. And, um, you know, it, it's it's a huge issue. And, again, these are all interrelated, whether it's the global warming hoax, the, the war on private property rights, the war on state sovereignty. And, the idea, you know, the, the U.N. doesn't give one lick about Indians or anybody else. Uh, you know, I think this much is, is clear just from what they do. You know, look at what they just did in Haiti. They killed uh, maybe 30,000 Haitians by introducing cholera there. Uh, they, you know, they kidnapped uh, an eight-year-old boy and raped him for five years, a mentally challenged eight-year-old boy. And then when somebody on the outside world found out, they had a kidnapper kidnap him again to hide him. So, you know, these are people who do not care. At, I mean, they almost seem to have, you know, no emotion about the suffering they have. Like, they've been doing this in every country that they occupy. And if you don't understand that it's part of a bigger agenda, you think, oh, well, you know, the Indian thing, that doesn't affect me. You know, that's not in, we don't have any Indian tribal governments in my state, so I don't have to worry about my ranch. I don't have to worry about my home. Uh, you know, all of these things, again, are interrelated. All of them are part of the war on freedom. And if we want to stop it, we do need to go to the root of the issue. You know, we, we could fight, uh, you know, one thing here and one thing there, but we need to understand that they're all related and that there's a single root to all of these problems. I, I couldn't agree more, and uh, we I think we fully understand, Alex and, and Elaine, I think we fully understand that the root uh, really to that problem is the United Nations, uh, as it's uh, popularly called uh, in various liberty circles, the Dictators Club, because people need to understand that uh, we are one of the very few constitutional republics in the UN. I mean, we're unique in the world. And uh, the UN of the 190 some countries that make up the UN, uh, I would say at least 50% of those countries are uh, socialist. Uh, a number, a, a large percentage are under some sort of a dictator or some sort of a uh, uh, authoritarian government. And some are under communism, and the reality is we are very much a minority, and yet we're at a point in our world's history where we're ready to turn our government over to that body and allow a global government that's uh, filled with people that absolutely hate 
what we stand for as a constitutional republic. Um, Elaine, would you uh, would you like to maybe talk a little bit more about uh, uh, the uh, situation with the um, uh, law with the regional, national, and international agencies, so that people understand just exactly how important it is that the uh, Indian tribes in in the uh, uh, people living on these reservations understand that so much of this policy is being uh, conceived without any input whatsoever from them. Not from their citizens, yes. I'd like to follow up on a couple of comments that Alex, you know, Alex is so knowledgeable about the whole wide world. I just stand in awe. My focus has been on the United States. I, I'm just a history buff. I love my country so much. I love American Indians and my own ancestry, and I don't have another country, so my focus is on the United States. But Alex mentioned the um, uh, the issue in Wyoming where EPA uh, expanded a reservation boundary by oh, a million and a half acres that took in three towns and the Wind River. That I'm very familiar with Fremont County. It's the biggest one in Wyoming, and I know the county commissioner chair very, very well. And uh, they are. The state of Wyoming is fighting that, but here's the Here's the kicker. The Environmental Protection Agency has zero authority to create reservation land. It has none, absolutely none. But it's doing it anyway here and there and everywhere. And it's, caused, it's created a little constitutional ditty called Treatment as States, which is throwing air quality, water quality, all the five congressional environmental acts, also unconstitutional. You can't have a state within a state, so they call it, oh, it's treatment as a state. But the bigger picture is that this administration, this current administration, has targeted um, food production, and and uh, and it is and that was the reason EPA expanded the the boundary of that uh, Wind River reservation to include Wind River and the breadbasket of Wyoming, and to transfer control of water to the tribes there, the Arapaho and the Shoshone. Um, the Obama administration and this, this Montana compact is a great model, and other tribes are watching it very closely. They want the same thing. The Obama administration has created these major river watershed, federal river watershed management plans. Under the Corps of Engineers, they did a bounded area of every little stream and tributary that feeds into the Missouri or the Columbia or the big rivers. And then within this bounded area, they allow one representative from a state and one representative from a tribe to de develop the policies for managing the water of the Missouri River or the Columbia River. So with the Missouri River watershed, that takes in nine states. So there are nine state representatives on the management board that sets policy. There are 27 tribes. So there are 27 tribal representatives on this same board. And so the management policy of the Missouri River has shifted where it was a priority for farming, agriculture, recreation, and economic development. It is now cultural resources and tribal needs is the priority that's been switched around. With the Columbia River Basin watershed, that's four states, Oklahoma, I'm excuse me, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Montana. So there's four state representatives on the Columbia River Basin. There are 53 tribes. I wonder who's managing the waters of the Columbia River Basin on that management board. So this is the kind of stuff that Congress enacts and the federal in, in, in agencies implement. And this is the kind of stuff that is capturing all of the waters in the western states and taking down crop production at the same time. Uh, if they either use the water, capture the water, or they'll use the Endangered Species Act, and they've wiped out the whole food production in the San Joaquin Valley in Central California. That was 20% of America's food, and it's gone. This Salish Kootenai Reservation is big-time agriculture, big-time agriculture, and we now have no, uh, no um, they've taken the water rights off the patents of the landowners. They've stolen them. They will become little tribal allocations. The tribe will let you know how much you can have, if any. And then to top it all off, Obama has come up with a drought, a proclamation to, to, to just pile on here. He came out with a proclamation in uh, uh, 
I think it was March of this year, a drought resilience proclamation. And this drought resilience proclamation will allow federal agencies, not only is the water being taken away from all the farmers and irrigators and cattle ranchers in the western states, now through this drought resilience, you will have federal officials coming on your private land to show you and tell you how you may use whatever little water you, you, might, you might get. So this, this it, it's not, it, it, it's such an upside down world. It is, we either have a constitution or we don't. Um, and it's just gone totally flipped in a, at a very fast pace. The, the other thing I wanted to mention was, Alex mentioned war, and I very seldom use the term war, but you need to know, the listeners need to know, elected officials need to know that most of this federal Indian policy is being implemented under under the authority of the War Powers Act. And that was transferred out to the Western Territories you know, the Louisiana Purchase Lands, the Northwest Territories, uh, the, the federal government needed the War Powers Act to settle the West, to create the treaties, to create the states, and do all those things. But once a state became a state, the Territorial War Powers Act could not be used against that state. It was only effective in territories. Well, right in the second page of the Water Compact for Salish Kootenai, there's a sentence that says that the Secretary's authority to take all these waters is under 43 U.S.C. 1457. 43 U.S.C. 1457. That is the War Powers Act being enacted by the Secretary of Interior against the state of Montana to capture all the waters in 11 western counties. And the governor and the attorney general say, oh, yeah, and we'll throw in $55 million, too. Tax, state taxpayer dollars. That is completely unconstitutional. The state, the, the federal government may not enact a war powers movement against the state. The state's not a territory. The Territorial War Powers Act is gone. But this is the underlying law of federal Indian policy. This is how a tribe can buy land on the market, take it off the property tax base of the state, and put it into federal trust under this very same authority of the Secretary of Interior, which is unconstitutional, completely unlawful. So, you know, there's so much that our elected officials don't know, and it makes what they're doing completely dangerous when it's all tied in with the very things that Alex is talking about. And I guess one last piece. I want to speak about oaths, because there's a perception in the in the Congress there's a, conception, there's a perception that we have, uh, and, and the federal agencies do, and maybe Congress does have a federal trust relationship with Indian tribes. Congress didn't create it. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court created it in the Three Marshall Trilogy cases in 1823. They said that the United States had a duty to take care of the dependent Indian, Indians, a fiduciary duty, and this applied only to the federal agency. That duty had no application to states. The states have no such duty. But that federal trust relationship and that duty needs to be looked through the lens of the oath of office that senators and congressmen and governors and state legislators and county commissioners, they take an oath of office to the U.S. Constitution. Those elected officials have a trust relationship with their constituents and a trust relationship with the U.S. Constitution. And what's happening is they're abdicating that trust relationship as forsaking the Constitution and the people they serve to just roll out this federal trust relationship with Indian tribes that is all lynchpinned under an unlawful act against the states, the War Powers Act. That argument is up in the Supreme Court now. And the Supreme Court will be taking a very hard look. It's in a New York case, a California case, it's in a Michigan case. It will certainly be in the big federal case that our our folks are going to be bringing against this compact. I mean, it, what's happening here is is the, the, the truly the dismantling of America, mm-hmm. and it's being rolled over and immediately replaced by these ten regional United uh, United Nations regions. They've already carved the United States up into these Agenda 21 and United Nations regions, 
And if you look at maps and under Agenda 2030 on their website, you will see no United States. You will see just 10 regions. So our country is the prize. Our country is the grand prize of taking this republic form of government and freedom and liberty down. And it has gone so far out beyond the John Q. Public's awareness that it's absolutely frightening. But the most frightening thing is that the elected officials and their staff and the people that are supposed to be serving the American people don't even want to talk about this or deal with this because they might be called a racist. You know what I mean? And, and well, I you know, and it's interesting, Elaine, because uh, I was contacted today uh, by Senator Dane's office, and I have to say that uh, Senator Dane's, uh, I know Steve Dane's very well, uh, a very fine gentleman, he really is, and um, I think that uh, maybe there, uh, some of the uh, force bill that he uh, just brought forward is being rewritten as we uh, have this program right now, uh, Senate Bill uh, 3014. Uh, is being rewritten and is going to change dramatically from what was uh, originally proposed. And I'm I'm pleased with that, but it also shows why programs like this one and conversations with uh, people like you and like Alex are so important because, frankly, our elected officials uh, hear an awful lot from the moneyed, uh, special interests that seem to have control over our government, and they very seldom hear from the people like you and like Alex and like myself because we don't get paid to do this job. We're doing this because we love liberty and we love this country, and uh, so we don't have money to throw around, and, and the people... Uh, the special interests in Washington have a lot of money to throw around because they all have a vested interest and it all lines their pockets. Well, the so, tribal um, gaming money, the tribal gaming money, Dan, hires hundreds of tribal lobbyists who are roaming the halls of Congress every day. In defense of our elected officials there, the pressure on them is huge. The contrib- political contributions is huge. The uh, the folks that come into town there in D.C. and say, oh, my people, my people. Well, they don't help their people, but they get the money for it, and, wh- and who knows where it goes. So I know that Congress is under a lot of pressure. But nonetheless, that's no excuse for making decisions that have such heavy consequence to the landowners, the citizens, the property owners, our Bill of Rights, our Constitution. You know, they've got to learn that to say no. They have to learn to say no to every tribal whim. They have to learn to say no thank you to big political money. They either want to k- help us keep our country or we're going to lose it. Absolutely. Or we have to get rid of these elected officials. I do really appreciate that Senator Daines is willing to modify his bill. But I also, also hope that he and his staff will talk to Senator Roberts about Senate Bill 3085 and those dozens of other forestry bills that all have the tribal giveaway in there. It all has to come out. The forest is the headwaters of the water, and the tribal expansion and the transfer of our state waters to tribes will knock out crop production. And it's just, uh, Mm -hmm. it's part of that whole big depopulation thing and everything Alex is talking about. I so appreciate the endurance and the work of Alex. It's just amazing. Really, really Yes, it is. And um, I I have to say that um, we've, had uh, the demonizing of people that talk about agenda uh, agenda 21 and agenda 2030 and uh, the things that now are pretty common knowledge and they're, they're well publicized if people would just look uh, they don't hide what they have planned and the thing is is it's time that our elected officials understand this is for real, and it's right in front of their very eyes, and they need to start paying attention because we are losing our country because of the fact that they have not uh, stood up and said, not in the United States of America. 
do um, that. Uh, Al- Alex and uh, Lane, I'd like to give you a few minutes just to very quickly uh, talk about uh, your publications, your books. Uh, uh, you're both very accomplished writers, and I uh, give you just maybe a minute apiece to uh, wrap up the show uh, with uh, things that you're working on and uh, books and so forth. So, uh, Alex, we'll start with you. Uh, well, thank you so much, Dan, for having me on the show. I really appreciate the opportunity, and uh, it's, it's really an honor to be on here with Elaine. She is just uh, so great and so knowledgeable about these issues, and I think if it wasn't for Elaine, nobody would even know about these things that are happening except the actual victims of it who would have no outlet, nobody to uh, you know get the word out and warn their fellow Americans. So uh, it's been really great to be on here. I do hope that uh, people will get a copy of the New American Magazine or at least go to the website. We've got... Uh, you know, coverage of all kinds of issues, some of these that we've been talking about on the show and a whole lot more. And, uh, you know, I am hopeful that we can still turn the ship around. If I wasn't hopeful that we could turn it around, I wouldn't be doing this, right? I'd be uh, working on a plan B or something. So, uh, but it does take education. It does take hard work. We do need to get involved. We need to educate ourselves. We need to educate others. We need to work with our elected representatives to educate them. Uh, And we can do this. So I do encourage people to go to thenewamerican.com. Uh, check it out there. If people want to get in touch with me, my contact information is available through the website. And uh, thanks again very much, Dan and, uh, and Elaine, for uh, for tonight. So. Well, thank you. Uh, Elaine, would you like to uh, wrap up with a few things? Well, I'll briefly mention two books that I've written. Um, one is called Going to Pieces, The Dismantling of the United States. It came out in 2005. Um, and it's in a second print. It's selling very well, going to pieces. And what I'll do, Dan, is send you uh, information on the two books, and maybe you could be kind enough to post them on your website or something. The they book, actually are up on the website. Oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah. The second yeah, book, just came, I just put it out in March of this year, is called Slumbering Thunder, and it's a primer for the spread. It's a, it's a manual for community leaders and elected officials it's a manual of my recent writings and how, sort of a how-to and what you need to know. It's called The Sombering Thunder, A Primer for Confronting the F- Spread of Federal Indian Policy and Tribalism Overwhelming America. So that's on your website, too. I'm going to leave with one horrific thought, just if I might, because I'm so worried about this country. I am so worried. Um, we had uh, Obama come out with the Indian Energy Policy Act in 2010. And then in, and you have to understand that 100 years ago, the Secretary of Interior by the name of A.B. Fall required that all major electrical and water systems in the new western states be located on or near Indian reservations. That was a good decision over 100 years ago because states were still being formed. And, and the federal government wanted to have a foothold on the water, the hydro, the dams, the rivers, the power companies that were going up 100 years ago. So fast forward to 2013, 2012, Obama comes out with the Hearth Act, a very benign act for housing, education, and whatnot. In the middle of that Hearth Act is a little section that allows tribal governments to long-term lease their Indian trust land where nobody else can look. They can, they can long-term lease their Indian trust lands to Middle Eastern countries for good economic development for Indian tribes. So Obama has decided that America's power grid is good economic development for tribes, and all that power grid is on a near Indian reservation. And then he's decided that there's not enough economic development happening on our Indian reservations, so they can bring in the Middle Eastern countries. And we have 326 Indian reservations in the lower 48 states, that's 326 private little places where the Middle Eastern community can come in. In addition to our sanctuary cities and our Syrian movement, we are a country being taken down by the current administration. And if Congress doesn't get in gear and reverse some of this, we're going down. That's why this November election is so, so important. So that's what I want to get out there. (laughs) And, and you're absolutely right. This this election is the most important election in the history of this country. There's no question about it. And we've had uh, things like the Civil War and uh, uh, certainly World Wars, but nothing 
compares to the loss that we are going to suffer unless we turn this country around and do it not tomorrow, not next year, not five years down the road, but now. So with that, uh, Kelby, uh, I want to thank our guests. I am honored to have guests with your uh, gravitas as part of our program. I thank you both very much and look forward to the next conversation with you. And with that, I will turn the show over to you, Kelby, and thank our uh, thank our listeners. Please uh, tune in next week, and we will hear another program of Connecting the Dots. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Mr. Apple. Ladies and gentlemen, we uh, we enjoy you guys coming on to these shows week in, week out. That's going to cl- conclude this week's show. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week, Thursday, 6 p.m. Pacific. God bless.